Say a good amen. amen. Savior is born. That's the title of today's message. It's not a long message, but it's a meaningful message. It means a lot to me because I'm a born-again believer. How about you? I'm so glad that a Savior was born. A Savior is born. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2, and then we'll also look in Matthew chapter 1. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Verse 11, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Can we all read that verse together? One, two, three, read. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Stop. Everybody say that out loud. A Savior. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Keep your finger in Luke chapter 2. Matthew chapter 1 verse 19. Then Joseph, Mary's husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Mary is evidenced that she is with child and she is betrothed to Joseph. Now, the way it worked in those days in that land is very different than how it works here. It's hard for us to get our head around the custom of that day, but God designed it very specifically for the birth of Christ. In the Western mind and in the Western uh, custom, uh, we get engaged, we propose, get engaged, get married, have the honeymoon, and off to wedded bliss we go. And the church said, Amen. In those days and in that culture, it was not the same way. There would be a contract for marriage. It would be equal to marriage. In order to break that contract, you would have to get divorced. But the husband and the wife would not live together for the first year. And the um, marriage would not be consummated at all during that time. It was only after a year's time that the bridegroom would come and collect the bride. During that uh, period of a year, he's been building a house, he's been getting ready. And at the end of that year, he would go and collect his wife and then there would be a big wedding celebration. So they were married, but they were not living together. They were married, but there had been no consummation. They were married, but they lived separately. And God designed it this way because the mother of Jesus had to be married and a virgin at the same time. You see what God was doing. In our Western culture, that would not work because on the day of marriage is the honeymoon. But in that culture, God designed it so that Mary could be in a holy matrimonial state and a virgin at the same time. Glory to God. Isn't God amazing? Turn to your neighbor and say, God is amazing. He thought of everything. So when Joseph realized that Mary was with child, uh, he did not want to humiliate her. He loved her. And so the word says that he did not want to make a public example of her. He was going to divorce her quietly. But then an angel showed up in verse 20. It says, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Say, thank God for angels. (laughs) Thank God for dreams. Thank God for a good night's sleep. (laughs) Maybe I'm taking this a little too far. Uh, appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife. See, she was his wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 21. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. 
Uh, Jesus means a deliverer. Uh, some scholars say it means Jehovah saves. For he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. So all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. There is so much in this scripture. Glory to God. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Praise the Lord. Uh, the Christmas narrative, the Christmas account is full of miracle signs and wonders. It is amazing. We have a virgin uh, who's pregnant and virgin who gives birth. We have angels appearing here and there to Zachariah, to Joseph, to shepherds in the field, uh, choirs of angels appearing and singing. We have a uh, miraculous supernatural star that traverses the heavens to lead the wise men. We have just miracles and signs and wonders and prophetic utterance and all those prophecies were coming uh, to pass that had been spoken of centuries before. It, it, it is just absolutely amazing how all of this comes together. But at the heart of the message is the phrase that we read earlier, verse 11 of Luke chapter 2. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior is born. A Savior. I, I, can, I cannot tell you how many, how many uh, times I have sung in church. Uh, various uh, cantatas and, and high praise growing up in church. I was a church kid, so I was in all the choirs. I, I sang in every Christmas performance you could sing in, and, and uh, all of the majestic um, orchestration that went on with it, you know. Uh, Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria. What does in excelsis Deo mean? I have no idea. It, for the longest time, I thought it was in eggshells, cease Deo. And I'm like, why are we talking about eggshells, you know, as a kid growing up? And, and, and so, but the heart of the message is, don't get lost on this, the heart of the message is a Savior is born. Somebody say, praise the Lord. I said, a Savior is born. Now, it's very clear about that. It does not talk about a great general being born. It does not talk about a philosopher being born. It does not talk about a political leader being born. It talks about a Savior being born. And the reason it's talking about a Savior being born is because what we needed was salvation. We needed saving didn't need a political leader, didn't need a military leader, didn't, we needed a savior, glory to God. And what did we need to be saved from? Well, we just read it there in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, he will save his people from their sins. The Christmas narrative, the Christmas celebration is all about the saving grace of God that deals with the sins of mankind. <laughs> Glory to God. And it's not only about saving us from our sins, but it is restoring us unto everything the original sinner, Adam, threw away. Glory to God. It's about our salvation, but it's also about our restoration. Our redemption, glory to God. Hallelujah. Mankind's sin began with the first man, <laughs> Adam, in the garden. And when you talk about sin, you're talking about loss. You're talking about something that was, was taken away. Uh, the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy. And, and the Bible tells us in, the Rome, in Romans chapter 6, the wages of sin is death. Well, what died in the garden? What did Adam lose in the garden because of his treasonous rebellion against the heavenly father? He, he lost precious, precious things. He lost his spiritual life. In the day that you eat of that fruit, you will die. He lost spiritual life and eventually physical life. 
He lost his communion with a loving heavenly father. You know, God used to walk with Adam in the cool of the day. He lost that. He ran from God after he had fallen in sin. He lost the blessing, which was the authority to rule and reign over the earth, uh, multiply and have dominion over the earth. He lost his blessing. He lost his spiritual life. He lost his communion with the Father. He lost his blessing. And he lost harmony between all other people on the earth. And there were only two. <laughs> he lost harmony with his wife because he was blaming her. God, it was the woman that you gave me that messed this whole thing up. And then within a generation, Cain was killing Abel. I mean, the whole thing was messed up. And so in the garden... Because sin had entered into his heart and temptation has entered into his heart and he believed the word of the devil over the word of the Lord and he chose to align himself with the devil rather than a loving heavenly father. He committed treason against the governance of God and sought to be self-governed, to be equal with God and he fell in sin. And from that fall in sin, spiritual life was gone. Communion with the Father was gone. Love between humanity was gone. And the blessing was gone. Our authority in the earth was gone. What a fall. I said, what a fall. We needed a Savior. I said, we needed a Savior. Praise God, a Savior was born. Hallelujah. Now, in today's society, we wink at sin. In fact, we sometimes glorify sin. We legislate sin, we make it legal, and, and um, we, we have a misunderstanding of, of the pain and the loss that, that comes from sin. But if you read the Christmas narrative and you realize what God has done on our behalf to save us and to redeem us and to restore us, and to give us back all that Adam had given away. It truly is a celebration of God's goodness in our life. The first Adam gave it all away. The last Adam seeks to restore all that was given away. Look in 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person. The last, man, the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Spirit. Uh, the, the first Adam was endued with spiritual life. The first Adam enjoyed communion with the loving Heavenly Father. The first Adam had absolute authority over the earth. If he spoke it, it came to pass. Absolute authority over the earth. He had a beautiful relation with his wife and humanity, and it was supposed to be defined by love and honor through, throughout the earth, and yet he gave it all away. The last Adam, Adam, not the second Adam, because there's not going to be any more Adams. The last Adam is a life-giving spirit. So Jesus Christ, the last Adam, happened to be the one that breathed life into the first Adam, formed of the dust of the ground, and God breathed life into it. You remember in John 20 when Jesus breathed into his disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit? I wonder where he had done that before. He did it into the first Adam, glory to God, when he imparted spiritual life. But that first Adam gave away his spiritual life. But the second Adam came to give us back spiritual life he is the life-giving spirit there is no spiritual life without the last Adam breathing on you oh praise the Lord glory to God Christmas is amazing Christmas is fantastic because it's all about the saving of the soul and the restoration in the kingdom it's all about kingdom life hallelujah I know I know we've reduced it to a little baby in a manger but it's bigger than that I, I know we, we reduce it to, to things in Latin that we don't even understand much of the time. In excelsis Deo, I have no idea. But it's bigger than that, glory to God. Hallelujah. So in the restoration process, Jesus said it all begins by being born just as he was born in the earth. We must be born into his kingdom, a spiritual life. It all begins with receiving back the spiritual life that Adam gave away. Look with me in John 3 and 3. Uh, 
Nicodemus came to Jesus under the cloak of night. And Nicodemus was a ruler among the people. And he came to Jesus. I know you're from God, he says. No man can do what he does unless you're from God. Uh, How do you get into your kingdom? How do you do what you do? What's the answer? And Jesus gave him the revelation that in order to get into the kingdom of God, there's only one way. You have to be born into it. Can't earn your way into it. Can't receive it by meritus award. Can't get there just because you're on a church roll. There's only one way to get into the kingdom of God. And that is to be born into the kingdom of God. That's why everybody in the kingdom of God is a child of the living God. That's why everybody in the kingdom of God is a brother and sister because we've all been born into the same family. That's why everybody in the kingdom of God is a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That's why God is no respecter of persons because every person in the kingdom of God is his child. (laughs) And God doesn't have favorites. Hallelujah. We're all his favorite. Glory to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think you're God's favorite. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Glory to God. Jesus answered Nicodemus in John 3 and 3 and said, Most assuredly, I say, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Only one way to get into the kingdom. Got to be born into it. So if you're trying to earn your way into the kingdom of God right now, stop. Just get born into it. Glory to God. And then let your good works Reveal your faith. Amen. Glory to God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, verse 5, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born of water, in other words, a human, an angel will never get into the kingdom of God. You have to be born of water. You have to be a human. But then you have to be a born again human, born of the Spirit too. Unless he's, a lot of people say born of water means uh, water baptism. That's not what we're referring to here. Water, born of water, a human, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in to the kingdom of God. Verse 6, but that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. I've been born of the spirit. How about you? Oh, thank God. Verse 7, do not marvel that I said unto you, you must be born again. Did Jesus say you must be? Or did he say you should consider this? No, you must be. Nicodemus, only one way to get into the kingdom. Got to be born into it. (laughs) Hallelujah. It's a family thing. Got to be born into it. Glory to God. Now, that is easier said than done, but the Christmas narrative gives us great revelation into exactly how God did it. How can I get into the kingdom of God when I am a sinner? I'm, a, I'm of the lineage of Adam. I'm completely fallen in sin. Uh, the Bible tells us in Romans uh, chapter 3 that uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A- everybody's sin, you, me, and everybody else on planet Earth have sinned sin and come short of the glory of God. Sin entered when Adam fell and and mankind has been plagued. How are we possibly going to get into the kingdom of God when we are sinners? No, we're not going to get into the kingdom of God. In fact, God, the just judge, the holy judge is going to judge my sin and reject my sin. I'm in a bad place. I'm in a terrible bad place. Unless unless my judgment can be put on somebody else so that I don't have to suffer judgment, but that willing, holy, pure sacrifice would be judged in my stead. He'll accept the judgment. I don't have to be judged. Now I'm available. I can get into the kingdom of God. Um, uh, Only one problem has to be a human has to be holy, has to be willing. Where do you find one of those? A holy human that's willing to die for everyone else's sin since he has no sin of his own. Where do you find one of those? Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. 
where did God find the substitute in himself? This is the most beautiful thing about the gospel message. This is the most beautiful thing about the Christian or, or the Christmas narrative. Because God needed a holy substitute. One did not exist. But God must judge sin because he is a holy and just judge. But he's also a loving heavenly father who wants to redeem the sinner. So... The love of God satisfied the judgment of God when God became a man, lived a sinless life, and died for the sins of the world, satisfying his own judgment. Who was the sinner's substitute? God himself. God the Son. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that glorious? Judgment had to be satisfied. Love satisfied that judgment when God himself became a man and died for the sins of the world. Glory to God. A Savior is born. Who's that Savior? God with us. Someone say praise the Lord. Someone say praise the Lord. Why? Why did it have to be God with us? Why couldn't it just been a really nice guy? Just another human, a, a really nice guy. Why did he have to be born of a virgin? Why did it have to go through all of these gymnastics? Why? Because God had to enter the earth so he could be the answer to sin and suffer his own judgment because he loved us that much. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God came by way of the cradle, satisfied judgment on the cross, proved his judgment was worthy at resurrection, and now he is enthroned in heaven forevermore. Now, the believer, or everybody, should look at the Christmas narrative and say, a Savior is born. A Savior was born because someone needed to be saved. The angel said, glad tidings to all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. Glad tidings to all people. All people needed a Savior. All people needed need to be born again. It's a free gift given by grace to everybody. And by receiving Jesus Christ, there's the opportunity then to be born again, born of the Spirit. Now, when you're born of the Spirit, that is not the end of the Christmas revelation. Because Jesus not only came to give us spiritual life, but he came to redeem and restore kingdom life. The born-again believer has entered into the kingdom. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. When you're born again, now you're in a kingdom. And now we're learning about kingdom life. And kingdom life is the revelation of everything that Adam threw away. As a citizen of the kingdom, and every child of God is, as a citizen of the kingdom, now I'm beginning to learn by faith what is given to me by the Lord that Adam gave away. So... The first thing that Adam threw away was spiritual life. I got that. I'm born again. Second, Adam threw away his walks in the cool of the day with the Lord, communion with the Father. I receive that because now I'm related to the Father. By the blood of the Lamb, I am a child. That, that is my heavenly Father. I can cry out, Abba, Father, glory to God. I'm a child crying out to Daddy. Daddy, help me. Daddy, save me. Daddy, protect me. Daddy, heal me. Daddy, come on, somebody. I have communion with my heavenly Father. It's not a distant relationship. It is an intimate relationship with a heavenly father. Listen, in the Old Testament, 
they had the architecture of the tabernacle, and that ma mirrored the architecture of the temple. And it was a series of courts, concentric circles, as it were, square, but concentric. And it would lead down to the narrowest place, the Holy of Holies, but there would be the large court. And there would be the court of the Gentiles and the court of the women, then the court of Israel. And then there was the holy place where the, the, only the priests could go. Then there was the holy of holies that, that the Ark of the Covenant was in. And only the high priest on the Day of Atonement can once a year could go in there and offer blood. And if on any of those places, if you went beyond your permitted place, if you were a woman and went beyond the court of the women, death. If you were a Gentile, went beyond the court of the Gentiles, death. If you went beyond the, uh, uh, the, your priestly pace, death. If you went into the Holy of Holies and you were not washed and cleansed and ready to go in there, you would be struck dead and they would drag you out by a rope. Death. They did not have free access into the presence of God. But now, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, Hebrews 4 and 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I do not have to wait outside the court. I said I do not, I'm not restricted. The veil has been rent. The wall of partition has come down, and I am invited to come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. I say, thank God, Jesus Christ has brought me back into fellowship and into communion with my loving Heavenly Father. So Adam threw away spiritual life. I got it back, born again. Adam threw away communion with the Father, got it back. I can come boldly before my father, just at the mention of his name, glory to God. He's right there. In fact, he lives on the inside of me. <laughs> Hallelujah. No more tabernacle, no more temple except for this one right here. Lives on the inside. Glory to God. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you, Paul tells us. Hallelujah. Boy, that was good. I'm going to put that in my notes. Glory to God. So he gave away spiritual life. He gave away communion with the Father. He gave away authority, kingdom authority. He was supposed to rule and reign over the earth. And God blessed them and said, multiply, fill the earth, and have dominion over it. But Adam gave that away. Jesus has restored that. And now in kingdom life, we're learning all about spiritual authority. We're learning all about how to speak to our mountain. We're learning all about how to walk in the authority of the Lord. We're learning all about how to clothe ourselves in the armor of God. We're learning all about the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. We're learning all about how to walk, that we're seated with Christ in heavenly places far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named. Glory to God. And and so the things that, that Adam, Adam gave away, Jesus has restored us to it. So when we come into kingdom life, we're learning how to live as citizens of the kingdom. And that's why in, in the Sermon on the Mount, the, the whole sermon is about kingdom life. This is how you live in the kingdom. This is how a citizen of the kingdom lives. And this is how you pray as a citizen of the kingdom. Our Father, Matthew, our Father who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Your name is so holy, Lord. How will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come. Why would I want his kingdom to come? Because I'm a citizen of it. I'm in the earth. I want the kingdom in the earth. I want the power of the kingdom in the earth. I want the operation of the kingdom in the earth. Come on, somebody. I, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Everybody say, in earth. Kingdom things are not just for heaven. One day we'll be there, and one day there'll be a millennial reign on the earth today, but not right now, but the kingdom can still be here now because the citizens of the kingdom are here now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so the reason that we're in the earth is to learn kingdom life. The reason we haven't been raptured out yet is to learn kingdom life. We are to be operating as citizens of the kingdom and learning what kingdom life is all about, what Jesus has restored back to us. Glory to God. And then finally, Adam gave away the loving relationship. 
between him and, and Eve, and then the children, one's killing the other, and then a mess. By, by the time they get to the Tower of Babylon, nobody likes anybody. And um, God is restoring love back into the earth today through his body. Jesus said in John 15 and 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He is restoring in kingdom life, he is restoring relationship. Not just relationship with the Heavenly Father, but relationship with everybody. That we are to love everybody. Love those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you, do good unto those who do you evil. We love everybody. We love the brethren, but then we love those who don't, aren't even born again yet. Because we're trying to love them into the kingdom. And so we love everybody. So when you look at... Uh, that what Jesus, a Savior is born to save me from my sins. Now I've been saved from my sins as a born-again believer. Now I'm in a kingdom. And now I'm going to start walking in everything that Jesus has restored to us in our kingdom life. He has restored to us communion with the Father. He has restored to us kingdom authority. He has restored to us brotherly love in this kingdom. And now it's my spiritual journey. Now it's on me. This is where my faith comes into play. Because everything that Jesus did from, from cradle to cross was grace. Everything that came through the cross into my life came freely by grace. But now it's just like the wise men following the star. Am I going to follow or not? Am I, I've heard about that star a long time. And there it is. I see it right in front of me. And it's leading me. Am I going to follow that star? Am I going to follow the Lord? Am I going to follow his word? Am I going to walk in kingdom life? This is a walk by faith. And this is my spiritual journey. This is your spiritual journey. So the narrative of Christmas, the Christmas revelation, is a great celebration of the birth of Christ. Yes, it is. But... Who was born? The Savior. Why was he born? To save me. What does salvation contain? Kingdom. Hallelujah. Am I going to walk in it? And that's where my faith life comes into play. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. There is born to you this day in the city of David, and band, you can come on up, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I would perhaps read it a little differently. There is born to me this day in the city of David, my Savior, Christ the Lord. This is why Christians get so excited about Christmas. Because it is the grand celebration, it's the recognition that not just an arbitrary Savior was born, but my Savior. Savior was born. My Savior dealt with my sin and made me a kingdom citizen. Did you get anything out of this today? Praise the Lord.